1965, uh, Steve Dicko left Marvel in late 65. Um, but even before then, he had started uh, drawing for um, Charlton again. You know, he hadn't been in the way that long, but um, most he had been working so much for Marvel that he had uh, only done like one or two comics for Charlton, you know, between the period of like 63, 64. And so in late 65, actually it was before he left Marvel, he started doing Captain Adam again. He had returned to Captain Adam, which you'll remember earlier in this video, he had drawn in the uh, early 60s, in 1960 and 61. Well, with this issue of Captain Adam, uh, which was, let's see here, Captain Adam number 78 from December 1965. That's the cover date. So this was around the same time that he was also still doing Spider-Man and Doctor Strange. And it says, you asked for it, the demand it, now you've got the new adventures of Captain Adam. So this uh, archive edition, DC archive edition of the Action Heroes Volume 1 reprints these Captain Adam stories. And so they're, you know, they're expensive, they're hard to find, but they, uh, they're they a good thing to get if you want these Charlton action heroes uh, stories that Dicko drew. And there's some more, Captain Adam. And most of these he didn't ink as well, he just did the penciling on them. Um... But anyway, it's done in more modern style than his earlier stories had been. You know, it was more action-packed. Um, and you have the introduction of Nightshade. Now, I have happen to have the original of this issue here. This is the original of that issue of Captain Adam, which I'll bring out here. So the coloring looks, you know, pretty similar. It does have a more of a faded effect here that looks a little more basic on the original than it does on this on this reprint. But um, this is Captain Adam number 82, September 1966. And there are the credits there. We'll just take a look at the uh, original. Let's take a look at the coloring on that because that yeah, that uh, flashback sequence is all colored in blue, and they've maintained that for the reprint. So it is being faithful to the uh, original. Here's an ad for Charlton's Action Heroes. And these became popular with uh, fans of uh, the superheroes. You know, comics fandom at this point had, had been born, and they were, um, you know, lots of fanzines. And Marvel really catered to that audience of the fanzines. Captain's column. You asked for it, you begged for it. Here's Captain Adam's letter page. And it says Dick Giordano, editor. And then there's a Judo Master thing at the back. Let's take a look, see if they reprint that letter uh, thing at the back of this one. Nope, we don't get the letter, that letters thing. But we do have Action Heroes Archive Volume 2. And you can see Captain Adam eventually gets a uh, costume change. And the Blue Beetle is added to the, um, as a backup strip to the series. Now, the Blue Beetle had been a, a Golden Age character, and Dicko had um, seen um, Charlton's revival of the character in the mid-60s, and in an inter interview in 1968, he said he saw it and he thought it was terrible. So even though he was working for Marvel at this time, it was like 1964, he uh, you know, drew up some ideas of what he thought a Blue Beetle character ought to look like, like if they were going to revive Blue Beetle. So... He, put, he drew down these ideas and then put them in a drawer. And then later, when he was started doing work for Charlton Superheroes again, the idea of the Blue Beetle coming back came up. And uh, 
he said he brought his uh, ideas out of the drawer and they went into the comic. So this is a really nice uh, printing of this issue. It's a lot thicker than the previous issue. Now, the same comic had been reprinted uh, before by Charlton uh, from uh, Modern Promotions was the company, Unisystems Incorporated. In my romance novel collection uh, videos, I've talked about Modern Promotions or Unisystems. Uh, they had a book series called Unibook, um, where basically they would take old books and paperback books and things like that and just reprint them for the department store market. Now, people talk about these being in bags, but a lot of times you'll see them with these yellow uh, stickers on it. It says 10 for a dollar or whatever. So maybe some were in bags, but I think a lot of them were just because that's how they did their paperback books. They just put, they had them sold uh, on a non-returnable basis to department stores. And so that the the cover price on here was the price that was not actually ever meant to sell at. It was meant to, it was sold at department stores at a discount price, um, which is how they would be sold to customers with that sticker on it. But anyways, you can see that the, the printing is way inferior to the original just by, just at a glance on this uh, modern promotions reprint. But, um, The archive edition the collection isn't perfect, as we shall see. I wonder what they took away on this one, because there's a blank space there. So it's a thing where the next issue blurb has been uh, removed on the on the in the uh, modern promotions reprint. And then you have the blue beetle. This is, again, it's a really nice printing. There's the thing with his mask where you need to touch the uh, the thing to open it or his, underneath his chin. And again, here's uh, the next issue. This was uh, also 84 was reprinted by uh, Modern Promotions. And I wonder if this is the one that has the, uh, I don't know if that's a different one. We'll go back here. So again, yeah, this is way preferable than the Modern Promotions reprint. But, you know, back, back in the day, these Modern Promotions uh, reprints were all that we had. Here's the uh, Modern Promotions reprint of uh, 86. Or is it 85? It's hard to tell. The printing is so bad. That's 85. As you can see, yep, the... Uh, Printing is not so bad on that one, but it's not the greatest either. Now, um, let's see here. Oh, that's not the one. You can see it says Concept and Art by Steve Dicko. There's the next issue. Now these I don't don't believe were reprinted by Marvel um, Modern Comics. But Blue Beetle number one was and that's Blue Beetle number one. Now this also Blue Beetle number one introduced a new character in the backup series called the Question. Who is the Question? And let's see here. So. Here's another comparison of the uh, the artwork. So yeah, I, I recommend just getting skipping these modern promotions and just getting the uh, archive editions. Now there is one bad thing though with these archive editions. Apparently, in the original, um, I think, and the I think this is what happened in the original Blue Beetle number one. Apparently, it was printed blank like this. <clears throat> because the lettering fell off or whatever. You'll notice that a lot of the lettering is done by quote unquote, a machine. That's how it was credited. It was just typeset. But um, all that lettering there, apparently that fell out, fell off on some copies of Blue Beetle number one. And then they, they caught the error 
and then they fixed it apparently. Well, when they did the archive edition, they did it from a copy that was missing that lettering. So that's why it's blank like that. It's not a big deal. You know, you can always, you, there's probably an image of that on the internet somewhere. In fact, we'll just set it right here if somebody wants to do a screenshot. That's what it looks like. That's what it's supposed to say. And then you have the question in here. Um, I always thought the question was kind of like a, a Green Hornet type of character. And it's interesting, one character is called Nora Lace. Whereas the Green Hornet secretary was called Lenore Case, which was very similar. Um, there's a crusading reporter. And we'll look at the, uh, here's the reprint of it. And again, it's just going in chronological order. So you have Blue Beetle number one, and then you have the Captain Random issue because it's going just by based on, um, you know, when they were published. And I don't think they had necessarily good uh, quality uh, or photo stats to work with on some of these issues because um, it sort of varies. Now, um, you know, because sometimes the art, the ink, the dark ink looks a little clotted up. Next issue, and there's a question. Then Adam, we're going to jump ahead here. There's, uh, I have another original here. Actually, uh, oh, here's Mysterious Suspense. Now, this was the um, question one shot that came out in 1968, I believe. And uh, Mysterious Suspense number one. There wasn't a number two. There wasn't a number issue of this. And in the year 2000, uh, DC did a... Uh, Millennium Edition reprint of this entire issue. And the first page of it is not drawn by Dicko. Anyway, he has a little introduction talking about the question. September 2000. And again, the artwork sometimes makes me wonder if there are better stats available, or I don't have the original copy of the issue, so it makes me wonder if the original has any better looking artwork. Because it does look a little dark. Um, you know, some of these panels don't look as good as you would expect from a Steve Dicko inked work. But uh, anyway, so that was, and this was the, uh, it's not, not too much better in this inking, but I mean, looks like they probably shot it from the same stats. This is a cheap alternative if you don't want to spend a lot of money on a hardcover book. I also have the original Blue Beetle number five here, which actually a friend of mine sent me. And you know, the this version looks more faithful to the original, although it looks better even. It looks more complete. Uh, but this is a uh, an example of a Blue Beetle story where Dicko's philosophy starts to... Uh, appear his objectivist philosophy starts to make its appearance in his comics you'll see this big word balloon it's like a, an attack on modern art and of course ted court is uh well this is vic sage is, is here and then uh ted court is you know the question of the blue beetle and their civilian guys is Now, of course, this would be the inspiration for uh, Rorschach and Night Owl and Watchmen. So that's where the team up of those two characters is from and uh, was inspired by. Heroes are outdated, an insult to the average man. It is a vicious class distinction that seems just blah, 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 blah. It's like this guy saying all this stuff. But Vic Sage, of course, disagrees. You can see where his, uh, you know, stances. Um, and then the question picks up from there. The question backup series. Oops. 
one there. Very much like uh, Dicko's objectivist creator on work that he would soon start doing. Well, in fact, this is 1968, so he has already started doing it. But uh, this is probably their first exposure to uh, for fans that you know Dicko has these this point of view. And then th this one uh, is a, in black and white because Blue Beetle number six was canceled before publication, which is an indication of apparently how how rough the uh, you know it is in publishing with sales because you would think they would just publish it. You know they already have everything all done. This whole issue complete, but um, they decide not to publish it. It's not worth it. They did have an ad for the cover, showing the cover in uh, other comics, but so it almost made it to publication. That's how fans knew it existed. And then this was also a uh, unpublished Captain Adam story that John Byrne inked uh, that later pe appeared in the 1970s Charlton Bullseye, Bullseye fanzine. Not to be confused, confused with the uh, early 1980s Charlton Bullseye comic, color comic. And then a uh, question story by Alex Toth from uh, Charlton Bullseye number five. And there's a biographical uh, write-up about Steve Dicko. So that's that. I do recommend this book. It does have a cover price of $75. But uh, between the two books, Action Volume Action Heroes Volume One and Volume Two, you get all of uh, all of his 1960s Charlton superhero work in a nice format, which is good to have. You know, you don't really need those uh, reprints that I just showed, those individual reprints, or even the uh, even the originals, really, unless you want the letter pages or something. So, this is what Dicko did immediately after leaving Marvel in 1965. Um, he also worked for other companies, too. For example, I don't have an original of these, but um, ACG um, was publishing uh, their own superheroes at the time. They were sort of third-rate superheroes. But um, this is a reprint of, from an ACG, a Mark Merlin story. Uh, so, or Mark, Mark Merlin, Mark Midnight, it says. That was the character's name. Mark Merlin, I think, is a DC character. Uh, but this was drawn by Steve Dicko and uh, uh, Seltra Panny, who also worked together around this time on some DC um, uh, stories for like Strange Adventures. So he did that. Um, you know, he did a couple of stories for DC with Celso Trapani and also ACG. Then, most famously, he did some work for uh, Warren magazines under uh, Creepy and Eerie uh, magazines. Now, Dicko did two different types of stories for these Warren books, uh, these Warren magazines. Some of them have a wash effect, you know, a gray wash. And then some of them are just straight black and white. So we'll take a look at both types here. Now, there is a book, if you want to get all of all of Dicko's Warren work from the 1960s, which is very highly regarded work. Um, there is a book published by Dark Horse Books several, some years ago, maybe 10 years ago. I think it's called Creepy Presents Steve Dicko. And it, it, public, it reprints all of those stories. This is Eerie number three which is somewhat falling apart on me, uh, from 1966, it looks like. And the pages are coming loose. But the important thing is the Steve Dicko work in here. So here it is down here. Room with a view. Art by Steve Dicko, script by Archie Goodwin. And this is one of those stories where it's all straight black and white. But it's very nicely detailed. I think Collector's Edition is another famous one that has this type of artwork. 
you know, it's more detailed than uh, some of his usual stuff. And then we'll take a, a look at another one here. And so this is a creepy 1970 yearbook. So this is reprinting. This is a 1970 uh, issue that reprints some of their better work. And Steve Dicko, I think, has two stories in here. Here's one of those wash stories I was mentioning. Blood of the Werewolf. Which starts out with a prologue. There's the uh, art by Steve Dicko, script by Archie Goodwin. You know, so a lot of people really love what he did with the gray washing on here. Um, you know, it really does look nice. And right after that is another uh, Dicko, Archie Goodwin, Steve Dicko story. This is a sword and sorcery story. So you can see it has some of that Doctor Strange look to it, but imagine if Doctor Strange had been done like this. There's more of an adult flavor to it than uh, some of the comics he had been doing. Another great panel. So you have that supernatural, you know, no one does it better than Dicko when it comes to like such occultish, supernatural looking, uh, looking stuff. So anyway, that's just a, an example of his Warren work. We saw three stories there. Um, if I had that book, I would just show all of them here. But um, I don't. But if you're interested, if what you just saw looks interesting to you, definitely get that um, book, The Creepy Presents uh, Steve Dicko. I should have it. I just haven't gotten around to getting it. All right. So now, also at this time, we got the Thunder Agents. And unfortunately, I don't have any examples of uh, uh, Dicko's Thunder Agents here. This is Thunder Agents number one. Uh, Wally Wood was involved in uh, doing this comic for Tower uh, Comics. This is from 1965, so it's right around the time Dicko left Marvel. And um, it was a really well done series um, using a lot of uh, nice you know, artists like Gil Kane and, of course, Wally Wood and Steve Dicko. Um, he, I think Steve Dicko only drew about four issues. I only just have a handful of issues of Thunder Agents. Um, and then by 1969, when this issue came out, it was all reprints. He drew uh, No Man is this character here, and he drew a couple No Man stories. Um, I might as well just show the rest of the Thunder Agents here. Thunder Agents have a long history because the characters were revived in um, the 1980s. First in a reprint series, uh, this is from JC Productions, which was distributed by Archie Comics. And then uh, Ditko did a new cover for them. So this is a brand new cover of No Man uh, by Steve Ditko. This is uh, August 1983, so right around the time he was working for Archie on their Red Circle Comics imprint. And there's the back cover without any of the lettering. And then the third and final issue of this reprint series. Again, no Dicko in it. And then they also did two issues of a new uh, Thunder Agent series before it got canceled. But there's no Dicko in this one, or e either one, actually. But um, when that series was canceled, Blue Ribbon Comics, which I showed earlier, um, Dicko had drawn the cover of number one, <clears throat> which reprinted The Fly. 
Well, this uh, is from September 1984. And Dicko drew a No Man's Story at the back of it. So this is a new, a new No Man's Story. Uh, penciled by Steve Dicko and uh, inked by Willie Blyberg. He does a decent job on it. Now, I'm, obviously, I'm jumping ahead way here to the 1980s, but I figured we'd get all our Thunder Agent stuff out of the way here. So, uh, then in 1985, it might have been 84. Let's check here. Uh, November 84, um, so late 84, uh, a company called Deluxe Comics started doing a series called Wally Woods Thunder Agents. And there became this whole legal hassle. But they had all these you know, great fan favorite artists on like George Perez and Keith Giffen. Steve Dicko, I think has one pinup in here of no man that, um, sort of anticipates the, uh, the strip that's coming. So there's the, the no man page just by Dicko, but it's, um, I don't think he has anything in number two, but number three, I think is when the no man strip starts. Here we go. So it's very similar to that. Um, I'm wondering why this, you know, was this intended as a cover or what? But um, anyway, so again, it's just penciled by Steve Dicko, this No Man story, and inked by Greg Thigston. And then issue number four of this 1980 series has part two of the, of the story. Again, there's the credits there, but just pencil by Dicko. Now, Dicko wasn't exactly a fan favorite by this point. He'd kind of fallen out of favor because of his artwork looking a little more cartoonier than uh, what people tended to like at this time. And that was it. So he just did that. There's also uh, this uh, Tomorrow's book that I have. That's the Thunder Age, Thunder Agent's Companion from uh, Tomorrow's. Let's see what year this was. Uh, this is 2005. He has a checklist of the Thunder Agent's comics. And then, uh, you know, just interviews and information about each of the people that worked on the comic. And there's a thing about Dicko in here. It shows that uh, that No Man cover. There's the pencil version of it, the inked version. So there's a little write-up about Steve Dicko in here. It shows that uh, 1984 No Man story, too. Anyways, so now, just to wrap up the stuff about Wally Wood, we're going to go back in time here. Back to 1969. And uh, Wally Wood, we're going to talk about Wits End in a second, but uh, I don't have any examples of Wits End to show. But Wally Wood was doing his own um, sort of small press comic magazine at this time called uh, Wits End, where all the characters would, um, all the creators would own the rights to, the copyright to all everything they created in the comic. And Dicko started working with him, too. So he was very early on, he started contributing. And Mr. A appeared, I think, in issue number two. First appeared in issue number two. We'll talk about that later. But um, so in the late 60s, this is something Dicko was doing. He was trying uh, all these different things. And Wally Wood was as well. And uh, while this is a 1969 comic that uh, Wally Wood did. As you can see, it says, Art by Dicko and Wood. Now, of course, Dicko is very much overpowered by Wally Wood's inking. You know, he, Wally Wood is the favorite Dicko inker for many Dicko fans. But um, on the other hand, it's very Wally Woodish. <laughs> you know, it's like the Dicko is very much buried in the Wally Wood. As you can see here, they would later work on Stalker for DC Comics in the mid-70s. We'll look at that later. 
And I don't think the, the rest of it's not by Dicko. They also did a uh, Jungle Jim comic for uh, Charlton Comics. I don't have that. Uh, I do have a reprint, though, that Roger Broughton, who had bought the rights to all the um, ACG and Charlton uh, original artwork, or he, he had basically bought the photo stats. I think he thought he was buying the rights, but it turned out Charlton hadn't properly copyrighted their material. So uh, anyways, he would occasionally issue these reprints using those photo stats. So you see this one featuring the team of Steve Dicko and Wally Wood. This was a reprint of a Charlton Jungle Jim comic. This reprint is from, doesn't say, 1995 or something. Anyways, you can barely see any Dicko in here. So you know, I'd have to look at a checklist to see exactly what is uh, Dicko. Of course, this one page is... Uh, a reprint from a Charlton uh, ghost story comic. Our zombies real. And there's what the cover image is from. And uh, while I have it here, there's another uh, Roger Broughton uh, comic here. A war comic. And I happen to notice uh, reprints a Charlton war story that... Um, Dicko drew. It's a, a genre that westerns and wars are genres that uh, he's really not that well known for doing, you know, obviously. But uh, there is uh, an example of a 1970s Charlton uh, war comic drawn by Dicko, which has a nice, uh, nice look to it. All right, and now we're going to get to his creator own stuff. In 1967, Dicko's Mr. A first appeared in an issue of Wit's End. I think it was issue number two, published by Wally Wood. Uh, Dicko got his start doing creator-owned independent comics a lot earlier than most of his independent, uh, most of his uh, contemporaries, uh, before the creation of the direct sale market. You know, at this time, the only small press comics being done were uh, fanzines or uh, like underground comics which had a you know drug culture that Dicko was not going to be associated with. So um, in the 1980s, 1985, this book appeared from uh, Fantagraphics, edited by Robin Snyder. And it was collected uh, all those early uh, Dicko ind indie work, the creator-owned work that he did. And there's an introduction there. Part one, the 1960s. With Mr. A's black and white card. This here is a illustration that he did for a fanzine. Um, you know, very elaborate, and uh, you know, it's it's amazing the stuff that he was doing just out for his own pleasure. And this is, I think, this appeared in Witson number one. I'm not sure, but yeah, this is 1967, and then Witson number two, I believe, is the first appearance of Mr. A. And uh, it's an amazing work. You know, this is, Mr. A is considered sort of a newer or later Dicko character. But on the other hand, this is 1967. You know, his, uh, this is just like a year and a half after his final Spider-Man story, you know, was drawn. And it's very different in tone, obviously. You know, Mr. A is considered more violent character, uh, unsympathetic towards criminals and people who are, well, like in this story, for example, there's a famous example. Uh, Angel is the bad guy who, like, kills uh, his friend, knifes the social worker who's just trying to help him. And, of course, Mr. A has no sympathy for the guy, knocks him off the building and is going to let him drop to his death. You know, some people have a, a problem with it. Obviously, you know, it's not something that most of us would want to see someone die. But on the other hand... I think all of us, when we hear stories of people who have just done horrible things, would uh, wouldn't shed a tear if you know the person happened to fall off a flagpole. Um, this is a second Mister A story, I think, probably also done for Wit's End. And as it goes on, it seems like some of the stories Dicko is doing to sort of answer some of the criticisms that he might have been receiving from readers. You know, well, what what about this? You know, and so forth. 
Um, <clears throat> and this has a beautiful zipper tone uh, art style to it. It's amazing to think that he was doing this work for nothing. You know, he was, I mean, I assume he wasn't being paid for it. And it's so detailed. And it's amazing to think that uh, there probably was an interest in the mainstream publishers of doing work like this. You know, he had no other place to really do black and white work that dealt with these um, <clears throat> these philo philosophical issues that he was tackling. <clears throat> As you can see, un uncompromising. He didn't have to conform to a comics code, unlike mainstream comics at that time. And some beautiful stuff where he's laughing, you know, through his mask. So anyways, these are uh, some of the pages that he sent to fanzine publishers. I believe this is the uh, Bill Shelley, the one that appeared in Sense of Wonder, but published by Bill Shelley, which we'll be talking about in a minute when we talk about the uh, Creeper in Bill Shelley's letter for, a little further into this video. Here's some more here. Some of these were parodied later, like there's a Ambush Bug. Keith Giffen's Ambush Bug in the 1980s did a little parody of Mr. A. It was like good and evil, and then there was the fourth one. The third uh, little thing was Pittsburgh instead of corrupt. This is one of my favorite Mr. A stories, how these well-meaning, this well-meaning council is trying to get rid of corruption, and they hire Rex Grain to get rid of, uh, you know, to investigate, to solve these problems of, uh, you know, get rid of the corrupt influences on, on life, city life or whatever. And then, uh, they gradually see that some of these people are friends of theirs, and then they want him to call off the investigation, and he refuses. And it's like, wow, can you be so heartless, you know? And, but, uh, so it's really like a character study of, you know, these flawed individuals. The, the hero isn't flawed. It's these people around him who are well-meaning, you know, liberals and do-gooders who, uh, you know, are just suckers, really, for these uh, people willing to take advantage of. And then finally, the good man is driven to evil himself, you know. he's It's like the do-gooder has now become this raving lunatic. He's heading for complete destruction. Anyway, these stories appeared in the uh, late 1960s. And eventually... In the uh, 1970s, they would uh, appear in their own comics. But like this, I think this was in an issue called Guts. This violence, the phony issue, this essay that Dicko wrote. <clears throat> and these are some more of these one-pagers. This is another classic one. This is from 1969, where a guy is saying, well, as long as I'm in the middle, I'm not, you know, I'm okay when it's like he's sort of dancing the line between good and evil. But Dicko's point in this is that there is no line. He doesn't, he was like, well, how did I end up way over here? And it's like, it's not two paths going the same way. It's there. It's like sort of a, you know, a, a staircase or whatever. You, you gotta stay to the good or else you're going to fall. And then we get to the seventies, but we'll save that for the future. In 1966, uh, Dicko started working for uh, lots of different companies, and one of them even was Dell. Um, I don't have issue number four of Nucla. This is issue number one with the cover torn off. Um, this issue number one was penciled by Dick Giordano, who was Dicko's editor at Char Charlton, and inked by Sal Trapani. And Dicko uh, started um, working with Sal Trapani, apparently, on some things. Like on AC and the ACG um, uh, story that we looked at, and um, issue number four of Nucla, like I said, which I don't have, Dicko um, penciled it and Seltrapani inked it. And around the same time, over at DC, Dicko actually did his first work for DC, although I guess he didn't really consider it him working for DC. He was kind of working for Seltrapani, so. 
this issue of Strange Adventures, which is number 188 from May 1966, has a um, story penciled by Steve Dicko in it. So this would have come out, you know, around the same time that his final uh, work in Spider-Man appeared. And this is reprinted, the story is reprinted in um, the DC Dicko uh, Omnibus Volume 1. And there was another story in the same issue. So Dicko penciled, Trapani inked it. And I don't think it's signed here, but uh, you can tell it's, you know, Dicko's art style. My copy is in somewhat rough condition. But, uh, you know, from those hand gestures, it's pretty clear, you know, who penciled this. So anyways, like I said, he did the next issue as well. Now, it's kind of too bad he uh, didn't get a, a hold on uh, DC's you know, mystery and horror t t uh, titles until the 1970s, the mid-70s, he started doing more work for them. Because if you look at a cover like this, this is uh, Strange Adventures number 196. This has a sort of Dicko-esque uh, look to it, doesn't it? Um, but this was actually drawn by uh, Jack Sparling. And the inside is by Lee Elias. Um, one of the stories, there's two stories in this issue. This is from 67. So I think Dicko would have fit right in. But uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen. So anyways, he did make his mark at DC, though, in 1968 when um, The Creeper and Hawk and Dove debuted. They both debuted in the Showcase Anthology title. And this is the first appearance of The Creeper in Showcase number 73. There he is. This must have made a must have been a huge surprise to a lot of collectors at the time, thinking, "Wow, Dicko at DC!" You know, this says March, April, nineteen sixty-eight. And there's the issue right there. There's a. Uh, Nice little transitional panel where there's no there's no breaks in the panel borders. It just happens all together in one panel, which we will see in other other uh, stories that he does. A strange tale told by the creeper, which of course has nothing to do with the creeper. It's a statement of ownership. And the split uh, split motif that Dick often uses. Anyways, great, uh, great stuff, you know. And this is reprinted um, uh, in the. Uh, there's a book that came, DC published called "The Creeper" by Steve Dicko, and it reprints all of, all of his Creeper stories. And he did a lot of them because he did this uh, issue of Showcase. Then this was immediately followed by a. Um, Oh, by the way, this has a. This was immediately followed by his own series, uh, Dicko, uh, about Dicko. It says, I never talk about myself. My work is me. I do my best. And if I, if I like it, I hope somebody else does it too, likes it too. So that's uh, Dicko on the record about himself. Uh, and then in the 1970s, he also returned to the Creeper. And we'll look at those uh, in a future video here. Yeah, it kind of makes you wonder, though, what some of the Marvel fans might have thought. I I suspect that because Marvel was very much a uh, brand, there was a lot of brand loyalty, that some, uh, some you know, Spider-Man fans, they just stuck with Spider-Man. They didn't follow Dicko over to the Creeper. You know, maybe some did, but uh, I would think the vast majority of Marvel fans may have turned up their nose simply because it wasn't a Marvel comic. Whereas if this had been a Marvel comic, you know, they 
They might have reacted more favorably. Steve Dicko, like lightning, strikes again. The hawk and the dove coming soon. Now, you know, it's again, you think uh, the creeper, you know, is somewhat of a... Uh, I love the character, but uh, you can imagine that it's, you know, I probably wouldn't own the, uh, the first appearance of, you know, a character like this uh, if it had been, say, Spider-Man or the Hulk or Iron Man or one of those characters because, um, or Doctor Strange even, because, uh, you know, it's, uh, even though this is only a few years later, you know, it's already a lot of the Dicko stuff can be found in the cheap bins and stuff. Now, not necessarily this. Although I didn't pay a huge sum for this. I, I'm not sure how much I actually paid, but I'm sure it was probably $5 or less uh, some, a few years back. I'd even forgotten I had it. Um, because for a, years I had this reprint of the same issue. This issue of Detective Comics. Number 443, one of those 100-page giants uh, from 1974. And uh, I had this issue for years that just, uh, you know, had the same thing that we just saw. It was a reprint of the uh, the first Creeper story. If you can find the splash page here. There it is. And it's just, you know, so if, if you're not able to afford the, uh, the first appearance of the Creeper, this one is a, uh, you know, satisfactory uh, substitute or like I said I would recommend these days just getting that book The Creeper by Steve Dicko and right there you see is uh, the first issue of The Creeper Beware the Creeper number one and uh, we'll take a look inside here Dicko's art at this period was really nice uh, and we'll look in, inside each, each of these issues very briefly so there's the front cover, issue number one, with his signature there, and his distinctive Dicko pose. You know, no one else really draws like this with just this combination of the lighting and the hand gestures and the posing. It's all, you know, very distinctive. And this was May, June, 1968. Plot and art by Steve Dicko. great face there so you know you have to think that at this point Dicko must have thought well I'm moving up in the world you know I'm uh, working for DC Comics I've gone on from you know working at Marvel on you know these characters like Spider-Man Doctor Strange now I can just do it at DC now obviously there probably wasn't going to be a uh, any any better deal for him because at this time you know if you did a a comic for dc or marvel they owned the whole thing lock stock and barrel for the most part there were you know exceptions like you know later when uh joe kubert's tour was uh done which i believe he owns the copyright to in the 70s but um for the most part it was uh just work made for hire even if you know, this was something he created. There's a great, great looking panel there. So yeah, it could be it could be argued that he was at his peak at this period uh, artistically, just with the lighting effects, the figure drawing. Um, you know, there's a uh, just a mastery going on, and it seems like he's kind of stretching himself too. You know, later on there might be some sort of a repetition of certain things that he knows works. You know, so he's not going to try to reinvent the wheel each time. Um, but here it seems like he's still he's still learning uh, what he wants to do. You know, with this new genre, you know, that uh, he hadn't, for the 1950s, he hadn't been doing superheroes. He had been doing other types of comics. 
And now, all of a sudden, in the 1960s, he's doing superheroes and just excelling at it and just uh, doing it like really no one else had done with his own unique style. And, you know, the athleticism of the characters, the anatomy, the poses, the just uh, so much here. And still also, though, you know, using some of his comic uh, drawing, you know, his cartooning and his uh, the humor is coming through as well. So it's a combination of humor and uh, action, you know, and intrigue. So obviously we're not going to look at every single uh, thing here, but there's a lot to be admired in, uh, in what he was doing here. Great little panel. And of course my, uh, my masquerade did not deceive you. It was Proteus, the villain. Well, this is a great little bit. This page here, they're fighting uh, Proteus and uh, the Creeper fighting with this billboard that's in the background. It has these, uh, it's a billboard for DC Comics. And it has these sound effects printed on the billboard. So when they're fighting each other, those are not actually sound effects. Those are printed on the board. You know, they happen to be standing in front of those particular sound effects. So that's a clever little bit that uh, he adds there. There's another Creeper's Corner with the uh, letters from the readers responding to previous issues. This is issue number three. Now, I, I have all of the issues of Creeper from the 60s except for issue number six, which was the finale, the last issue. the credit boxes. You have more amazing uh, amazing artwork. Let's see here. Let's see if there's a letters page at the end of this one. Yep, there we go. And there's a great little Last panel, page of panels there. This is a funny thing. You know, there's a letter by, from Howard Siegel, and then Bill Shelley has a letter here. And he says here, uh, I've, I'm a bit leery about Steve Dicko plotting the stories. I've heard that he is sometimes difficult to work with and often wants to do things his own way. He tend to, tends to put too much action into the creeper, blah, blah, blah. And Dick Giordano, the uh, editor, replies, Steve Ditko, hard to work with, only if you consider a sincere, hardworking, thoroughly devoted perfectionist as being hard to work with. If Steve ever wants to do things his way, it's because his way is almost invariably the right way. Um, you know, which is sort of a, a different, different uh, attitude, perhaps, than he was receiving uh, at Marvel which may not have been uh, so accepting. You know, Dick Giordano being the editor who had worked with him on the Charlton uh, action heroes at, at Charlton. Um, you know, and you can see on the credits too, which I mentioned before when I was talking about Doctor Strange. You know, at Doctor on uh, Strange Tales, uh, the Doctor Strange uh, credit box I showed in a previous video, the uh, part two, of 1960 to 1965 there's a credit box and it shows you know steve dicko being third uh from the you know top like stan stanley's name was first as editor roy thomas's name was second as scripter and that was like plot and art by steve dicko he was third in line here at uh on the creeper dicko's rightly created and drawn by steve dicko 
Although this one does say it's plotted by Denny O'Neill. This is an interesting uh, panel when he's starting to do those shy, uh, that side, uh, those lines indicating the uh, shadow on the side of the face. You know, this is, the, and that's the time when he starts doing this. I'm wondering if, like, he sort of picked that up from someone like Neil Adams, you know, if he was looking at that and thought that's a good way to indicate shadow. You know, because he didn't really do that before, but now, you know, he's doing it a lot. You know, and sort of indicates, a, you know, three, it's like a three-dimensional effect, although the lines are not, you know, they're just flat, flat lines, straight lines. And here's another creeper's corner. And then we just got, I just got one more issue of the creeper, this one here, it's issue number five. Great cover. I mean, this is just a, a tour de force, you know, of, of lighting and shading and everything here, and, you know, composition. He has more like angled panels. At this point, uh, let's see here if it says the credits, Mike Pep inked it. And I believe as you go along, Mike Pep's style becomes more prominent. And this was around the time that uh, Dicko apparently, uh, as you can see in this page, this has some very undickoy looking uh, drawing. Um, he had a rebound of uh, tuberculosis, which he had suffered from in the um, 1950s, around 1955 or 54. And so apparently around this time, he uh, got sick again. That's the story anyways. And... Uh, that's why Hawk and Dove and the Creeper both ended up getting uh, canceled shortly after. You know, or that's why he left too. He didn't. Uh, he didn't finish him out. So uh, here's another Creeper's corner. Like he only did a couple, the first couple issues of Hawk and Dove, and then uh, he checked out, and Gil Kane took over. So I don't have the I don't have the first appearance of Hawk and Dove. That was in the showcase issue shortly after Creeper the Creeper first appeared in, in showcase. Um, but I do have number one, and we'll take a look at that next. Now Dick only did a uh, a few a couple issues of the Hawk and Dove, and then again he had to leave it. So this came out a little bit a few months after Cre uh, the Creeper got his own comic. This is August September nineteen sixty eight. And of course, the hawk and dove has to do with you know the popularity of the phrase uh, in relation to war at that time in 1968, the Vietnam War specifically. Were you a hawk or are you a dove? Um, the thing is, the people assume that uh, Dicko was in favor of the hawk, and you know despised the dove. But Dicko's um, Dicko, I don't think, is showing that, you know, blind force of violence in itself, divorced of any, uh, you know, uh, thoughtfulness or consideration or ethical concerns and so on. Any strategy, you know, is, uh, you know, that there was a time and place for uh, responses. You know, force could only be used in, uh, in retaliation you know, as a retaliatory force and in, uh, and in proportion to the force could only be, you know, retaliatory force could only, should only be used in proportion to the, that, which is, you know, being used against it. Now, of course, the dove is, uh, paralyzed into inaction by these, uh, you know, his unwillingness to use force, you know, the, their father is showing the, the judge who's showing the, uh, uh, that neither side is right. You know, so he's sort of the moral center 
of the whole the whole thing. But uh, yeah, they have their squabbling, you know, and Dicko is more uh, uh, more likely to show the kids, you know, the teenagers sort of uh, in a, uh, you know, an amusing light as sort of squabbling amongst themselves and stuff and not being unsure of themselves and so forth. So there is a bit of a Spider-Man quality. There's a nice center spread there. Um <clears throat> anyways you'll see that again this sort of duality and thing with like the judge character with uh later in speedball in the 1980s with um uh robbie baldwin's parents <clears throat> who have these you know uh differing views about things these arguments which of course in later years you know people ignored they were less interested in the issues that Dicko was raising. They just wanted, you know, to have a more conventional comic book rather than uh, a debate. Nice little ending there. There's a fanzine page. Are you a fan or a reader? All right. Put this back in its bag. And now we go to issue number two. This was a good issue. I, I think this is probably my favorite of them. You know, the Dove does kind of save the day here, if I remember right. You know, if I, there was like a convict who doesn't want to be aggressive. And then, if I remember all this right, and Hawk is like engaging him. And then Dove is like, ends up reasoning with them or something like that or tying them up or something huh it's like these this pure deco right here <laughs> yeah it's great great stuff <clears throat> Yeah, it's really too bad that uh, what happened where, because of his health, the rest of these, if I remember right, the rest of these issues were drawn by uh, other artists like Gil Kane. So here's Dove wanting to uh, reason with the guy. You know, he doesn't want to use force. <laughs> This is great stuff. Yeah, you proved it, but was it worth it? Another victory like that, and you'll spend the rest of your life in the hospital. And there's the letters page. All right. We'll just take another quick look at these uh, these other Hawk and Dove issues. Like I said, I don't think the rest of these were drawn by Dicko. Number three, four, five, and six. I think that's the rest of the series before it was canceled. Let me look inside number three to be sure. And again, I don't think these would have been reprinted in the uh, Dicko Omnibus. So yeah, these... Says uh, Gil Kane and Sal Trapani. So, you know, still drawn cool and stuff, but, um, you know, it was too bad that so early in this work, uh, Dicko was gone. Hmm. 
you know, before it really had a chance to develop. There's the letters page. I'll take another quick look at this. Other Hawk and Dove issues, might as well. Number four. Again, Gil Kane and Selter Penny. There's the letter page. This is a two two page uh, letters page. got two more issues here, so we'll take a look at those as well. Again, no Ditko contact in those. In the rest of Hawk and Dove, you know, issue number three to six, there's no Ditko content. But, uh, you know, if you're a completist then on the characters. Now, this one's written and drawn by Gil Kane, who, you know, is a great artist himself. But unlike Ditko, is not necessarily as known for... Uh, Creating original characters, you know, he he did the uh, his name is Savage uh, graphic novel around this time, which was an innovative uh, thing to do, but not quite the uh, creator of characters, you know, that Dicko was. Dicko was much more interested in creating his own characters than uh, than drawing. You know, simply drawing other characters, other other people's characters. And this, if I remember, it is the last issue, in 1969. And some nice art, a great panel. Typical uh, Gil Kane uh, action shot there. And ending with the uh, final panels is the end of Hawk and Dove. And no letter page on that one. So that was that for Hawk and Dove. Dicko um, had a. Uh, you know, to take care of his health. But unfortunately, it meant the uh, cancellation of these two promising uh, DC series. And uh, so after this, he didn't, he stayed away from DC for a few years after this um, and began to focus more on his creator own stuff and also again doing ghost stories for Charlton, which we'll look at next. Although we often think of the Charlton Ghost comics as being 1970s Dicko work, uh, it actually started earlier. It started in the uh, late 60s. In fact, this issue right here, Ghostly Tales number 56, I believe is the second issue of Ghostly Tales. This is July 1966. So this is, you know, while his uh, last issues of Spider-Man were appearing. Now, Dicko's involvement at first was somewhat limited. Um, this story here, you can tell, is penciled by Dicko, um, but it's inked by somebody else, because the you can tell because the artwork looks a little different. You know, there's little touches of Dicko-ness. But um, it's sort of buried underneath someone else's inks. You know, it's a very Dicko-ish 
look. And so that is the only Dicko story in the issue. Now, Dr. Graves was a backup story at this point. He was a ghost investigator. So Mr. Dead hosted the stories, and Dr. Graves was the Ghostbuster backup series. So, uh, like I said, Dicko's involvement at the beginning was very limited. Um, I think this story, he also does a penciled. Uh, this one is number 58 from November 1966. There's Mr. Dead. We got the Pat Boyette story. So already, even though this is still during the you know, mid-60s, 1966, when the action heroes are still being published. Already you're starting to have some of the template of the the style of comics that the ghost com Charlton Ghost Comics would be known for, having a Pat Boyette story and then a Dicko story. Again, this is one that he didn't ink, so it looks a little different. But you can tell that's Dicko's work in there, buried underneath there. Some of it's really hard to tell, though. Some of this doesn't even look like Dicko. But you got a picture there. You know that's Dicko. So it's hard to say, you know. But he was still involved in Charlton then. And still doing... Uh, well, he was working on their ghost comics at the very beginning of when they first started them. But not too, uh, not too involved. Um... And let's take a look at another here. I don't think this one has any Dicko. This is issue number 64. And now 67, you can tell right away, that's Dicko. Um, we'll take this out. And this is July 1968. And again, you have a Pat Boyette story in there. And this looks like Jim Apero, who would soon go to DC. And then here's Dicko. The splash is just his, uh, you know, the cover is just taken from his splash page. So this, this looks like he inked it himself. There's little touches that you can kind of tell it looks like his work. So he's taking a little more involvement than he had before. This has a letter by Fred Hembeck uh, in there. Now the second, um, oh, and also this one here, you can really tell this is another, this is number 69. So originally Ghostly Tales was the first Charlton Ghost comic. This is October 1968. I'll just skip ahead here to get to the Dicko. There's, again, it's just reusing the, the splash is being reused as the cover. This has a funny, you know, very comical, you can tell Dicko's really going to town with, uh, you know, Mr. Dead's reactions to everything. And this little scene where he offers a newspaper to, so the host is interacting with one of the characters. This is the kind of thing you think, you know, Dicko must have loved doing. You know, just to add more interest to uh, to the story. It's a rather long one. Usually the um, uh, Charlton Ghost stories were around eight pages long, each story. But again, this is at the very beginning. This is 1968. So the template hasn't totally formed of what a Charlton Ghost comic is supposed to be like. But like I said, Ghostly Tales was the first one in 1966. Then uh, Dr. Graves, who was the backup feature, got his uh, own comic, The Many Ghosts of Dr. Graves. And then this is issue number two from July 1967. And you see uh, there's art by Chick Stone. There's a Jim Apero. Oh, no, that's Pat Boyette. And let's see if there's any Dicko in here. Nope, no Dicko. So 
So Dr. Graves gets his own comic, but no Dicko. Um, here's issue number nine. And this one, let's see. Yeah, this this has really nice art. Now, Dr. Graves is a main character in this. You know, he started out as being a main character in, in, in his backup strip in uh, Ghostly Tales. But, um, you know, eventually would become, uh, you know, just a host of the show. Of the, or not the show, but the comic. But this has really nice art. It's reminiscent of those Mr. A that he was doing at this time. You know, that's very much like the Mr. A, one of the Mr. A, early Mr. A panels. That's another great panel there. And you can tell from his gestures, it's sort of a Dr. Strange-ish hand gesture. It's a really nice work. This is probably one of the best drawn ghost stories that uh, Dicko ever did. You know, in just in the uh, sense of his the sketching and stuff. There's the letter page. This letter page has a, a letter from Klaus Janssen, who would later become a famous uh, comic book artist. And issue number 11 of The Many Ghosts of Dr. Graves. You can tell that's Steve Dicko work on the cover. So we're still in the late 1960s here. This is uh, January 1969. And like I said, we usually associate this work with his 70s work. Um, but he was doing it in the, uh, in the uh, 60s as well. And now the most famous one, The Ultimate Evil. This is a modern comics reprint. I don't have the uh, original. It's in nice condition. Uh, and this has been reprinted later, like uh, Craig Yo's Creativity of uh, Dicko book that came out about 10 years ago as a reprint of it, which we'll take a look in a probably part two or part three or however long these videos get. But uh, a lot of people comment on this story because the Dr. Graves sort of resembles uh, Dr. Strange in this issue. He's like opening uh, portals to another dimension you know, and so forth. And then fighting uh, this bad guy. You know, he's doing these incantations and so forth. And then there's the villain that he's fighting. You know, so people always comment on this being somewhat of a, a Doctor Strange-ish uh, story. You know, he's fighting with uh, his mystic powers which, you know, we didn't know he had. So yeah, that was a 1968 <clears throat> Charlton uh, ghost comic by Steve Ditko. And so he was still doing uh, ghostly tales. Well, some issues, not always. Some of these don't have any work by uh, Steve Ditko. But you see there's still 12 cents each. So this is still 1960s. And it's until the 50 centers that you get into the 1970s, I believe. Let's see what year this one is. So this is November 1969. So we get to the end of the 1960s here. But uh, there's a Dicko story there. Just told by looking at it. It's his distinctive art style. You know that he starts to do more of that. <clears throat> excuse me, more of that shading, the uh, you know those lines across the face, and that will become more distinctive uh, or more um, <clears throat> more pronounced in the nineteen seventies work. And uh, there would also be a uh, another ghost comic that they would introduce in the late sixties called Ghost Manor. This is from January 1969. 
I don't think this issue has any any deco in it. But uh, so at this at the when we get to 1969, Charlton actually has three ghost comics: Ghostly Tales, The Many Ghosts of Doctor Graves, and Ghost Manor. This Ghost Manor will eventually get retitled Ghostly Haunts and be hosted by Winnie the Witch. Right now it's hosted by this gypsy character. But anyways, so we'll get to that in part two of our video when we talk about the 1970s. And that's the end of the 1960s period uh, for Steve Dicko's career. He does start the Avenging World in Whitsend, I believe. Um, and I think in Reason Magazine there was... Uh, some uh i think of avenging world but um so he starts it in 1969 but this what you see here this avenging world comic didn't actually come out till 1973 um and he's also still doing mr a and again these this is a reprint but those publications will be collected into their own comic books in the early 70s which we'll look at in a future video so the next video that you see will be uh, in this in, in this series will be uh, looking at his 1970s Charlton Ghost comics. We'll look at those next, and then after that, uh, we'll look at uh, the rest of his 1970s stuff, including these comics you see here. So that's it. Uh, that's uh, right now um, we covered in this video 1965, uh, roughly 1966 to 1969. And in future videos, we'll just continue uh, covering his career going forward. Thanks for watching.